Shalom everyone, this is Amir Tsarfati and I'm live from my home here in Galilee and uh, <clears throat> I lowered my, uh, um, I guess, temporary studio from my office to my living room just because um, it's uh, sometimes uh, impossible to hear myself because of all the takeoffs of the F-16s in, in the last uh, <clears throat> few hours. So, um, again, I'm live right now. We're going to start the live Middle East update in just about two minutes. And um, I hope that you guys can log in and join us. This is a very important and interesting update regarding the situation right now on the Gaza border between Israel and the Palestinians. But also we're going to talk about other things and what is probably even behind the scenes when it comes to the new aggression of the Islamic Jihad and the Hamas in Gaza. So let's see who is um, who is online right now. I see people from North Carolina. I see people from Colorado, uh, the Silicon Valley in, in California. Denmark, Copenhagen is in the house. We see uh, people from Chino Hills, Colorado Springs. I see people from the UK. United Kingdoms in the house. We see people from Orange in Grace Chapel. Oh, wow. Okay. We see Tammy from Tennessee. I see Canadians. I see people from Georgia. I see people from Minnesota. People from Illinois. Uh, I see Charlotte, North Carolina is in the house. Toronto is in the house. Toronto, exactly a week from today, we're having our um, awaiting his return prophecy conference and it's going to be awesome more than 2,000 people are going to be there to um, and it's not going to be live so uh, you're going to have to wait with the messages there for later on to be posted I see people from Texas people from Kentucky people from Vietnam wow <laughs> I see uh, people from um, Nevada in the house Arkansas in the house. I see people from uh, Tustin. <laughs> okay. Um, we see more and more and more people from all over the world. The, the state of Washington is in the house. The Netherlands are in the house. South Carolina is in the house. Michigan is in the house. Germany is in the house. Mississippi. Italy is in the house. Sarah Britty from Italy. We see people from Oregon, people from uh, Singapore. Uh, it's pretty late over there. It's more. It's a, probably about midnight. I see people from Alabama, New York City, Mississippi, uh, people from um, other places. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 7 p.m. It's... Uh, Amir Tsafati right here, and I'm live from Galilee for my home, uh, less than 24 hours before I'm heading all the way to the UK uh, to change planes there, all the way to Washington, D.C. for a very exciting um, congressional um, breakfast um, over there with congressmen. Um, and then from there, I will continue to Toronto, where I will have my awaiting his return conference together with Pastor Jack Hibbs, Pastor J um, Barry Stagner, and uh, Jan Markell, of course, of Olive Tree Ministries. Uh, we're going to have such a great time there, and we're going to talk about it in a few seconds. Um, I will start this update. This is a special update, especially because of what is going on right now in Gaza, in Israel. More than 200 and almost 250 rockets were fired from Gaza towards Israel since 10 a.m. this morning here in Israel. So it's been nine hours with more than 250 rockets. That's a lot of rockets. And we'll talk about how God is watching over Israel. We're going to talk about what are the options and we're going to talk about what really happened. So, folks, um, let's pray and start this very special and interesting Middle East update. Father, we thank you so much for... Uh, the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and, and educate one another with the things that are happening, the things that matters, and uh, 
and also to connect them so beautifully to your word, your prophecies, your good news. Father, we thank you that uh, as your children, we know your plans as you discovered to us, as you uh, uh, unveiled them to us uh, through your prophets. And uh, we thank you, Father, for what you said through the prophet Isaiah, that you are the Lord, your God. There is none like you declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying your counsel shall stand and you will do all your pleasure. We thank you, Father, for that. And we can't wait to understand and behold that which you have prepared for us. We bless your name this uh, evening from Galilee, Israel, and from all the four corners of the world where you have your children eagerly awaiting your return. And we ask all of this in the name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who overcame and is worthy to open the seals and the scroll. We thank you in his name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shalom, everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati, and I am live from my living room here in my house in Galilee. And um, uh, I'm going to give you a, a, a short um, update on what is going on right now on the Gaza border between Israel and the Palestinians since 10 a.m. this morning, nine hours ago, folks. Uh, we're talking about more than 200 almost 250 rockets that were um, launched by the Islamic Jihad and we believe also Hamas all the way uh, from uh, the Gaza Strip towards the Israeli towns and villages um, around that area. Of course, uh, this time um, the range of the rockets went all the way to almost two, uh, to almost um, 40 kilometers in places like Ashdod and Ashkelon were not the only thing, even Gath. Kiryat Gat and, and further towards Beit Shemesh, uh, we even heard the air raid sirens. The um, um, Iron Dome uh, intercepted over half of those rockets in the air. And uh, in fact, most of the rockets fell either on um, just empty um, field or they were destroyed in the air by the Iron Dome. However, there were two direct hits, maybe even three, as I'm reported in the last few minutes, maybe even three, uh, direct hits in some uh, buildings. Uh, two casualties so far were taken to hospital in Ashkelon. One is a, a, a male and one is a female. Both of them are not in life risk. They are being treated well. And I think that if you really think about it, um, when 250 rockets are being launched at a populated area and only two people are being injured um, and 95% of the rockets are not even hitting any populated area, this is an amazing thing. This is an amazing protection of God. By the way, maybe throughout this broadcast today, you're going to hear just about three miles away from my house is the Israeli airbase, the F-16 airbase, we've been hearing takeoffs um, non-stop uh, ever since uh, probably about 1 p.m. for the last six hours or so. Uh, they might go on, on some more missions. One of the missions that uh, they successfully completed uh, was destroying an Islamic Jihad uh, cro uh, border, a cross-border um, terror tunnel that actually entered into Israeli territory and we we were watching them doing that, waiting for the right time to destroy it. And since there's a conflict right now, and since we attacked them anyway, that was the right time to destroy it. Um, this is exactly why Israel is not really too, um, uh, I guess, uh, 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 maybe uh, panicky about situations like that. Because whenever they start firing rockets, this is the right time for us to... Um, set the score with everything we need to when it comes to their terror activity throughout the year. Um, Islamic Jihad and Hamas understand one thing. Israel next week is celebrating its 71st birthday. We're celebrating next week a year since the 70th anniversary. And uh, 
just a couple months before last year's Day of Independence, they started all those, um, you know, violent um, gatherings on the fence and the un never-ending um, cycles of, of firing rockets and all of that. And uh, looking back a year from when they started, nothing had changed. In fact, their situation today is even worse than they, when they started. If they ever thought that the world will give them the attention, and if they ever thought that they're going to gain anything from their violent activity, they were proved wrong once again. And um, just like uh, our first pri um, foreign minister said, Abba Ibn, the Palestinians never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Every time there is an opportunity, um, they are missing it. Now, you have to understand something. Uh, personally, and you don't have to agree with me, I don't believe there is a nation called Palestinians at all. I don't believe they have any history. I believe that this is a, you know, it's a collection of Arabs who came to the land of Israel. At the time, the land was called Palestine. Therefore, they call themselves Palestinians. But they're all, they know exactly where they came from. Um, when we say it's a Jewish state, we're all Jews. <laughs> we, even though we came from over 80 different countries back home, and we call it the, the Jewish state, we're all Jews. They are not all Palestinians because they only moved here about 100 years ago or so, and most of them moved here because of the return of the Jews back to their homeland, and they saw it as an opportunity to work and to have better life than where they came from. So there is no Palestinian nation. Uh, they, they keep saying that. They keep going back to the Canaanites or the, to the Philistines. But it, they know it's not working. And so because they're not a nation, they don't even agree on a state for themselves. The Islamic Jihad and the Hamas are not in agreement with the PLO, with the Palestinian Authority. One is controlling the West Bank. One is controlling the Gaza Strip. They don't even agree between themselves on what they really want. And therefore, when the world is trying to shove down the throat of the Israelis a two-state solution, even the Palestinians themselves were not in agreement on how it's going to be. So my point is, is that when we are approaching the day of the unveiling of the Trump peace deal, um, let, me, let me tell you one thing. The two-state solution is not going to be an option on the table as the one and only way to achieve peace here. That had, this whole um, smokescreen of the real attempt to destroy Israel is long gone ever since President Trump was elected and he is in office. Um, and so it is going to be very interesting to see what Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt uh, Green, uh, and, and, and the others are going to unveil. Uh, one thing is for sure, this is going to be a comprehensive peace plan that will involve Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and, of course, others all around. And that will enable Israel to move forward with, uh, without issues on the table that are now there. Look, somebody needs to tell the Palestinians that even biblically, there's not going to be a Palestinian state, just so you know that. I don't see it in the Bible. I don't see how it's going to happen. I do see how the land was divided. It has been divided before between the different um, empires. But I do also see that ever since God started bringing back his people to their land, um, the attempt to divide it is not really working because he God is moving in a much greater way uh, than all of that. Now, just so you know one thing, um, the timing of this uh, violent uh, circle right now is not a coincidental. Israel next week is going to celebrate uh, two things, the Memorial Day, and I don't know if you understand what it means for us, the... Memorial Day for the Holocaust, where we lost 6 million Jews before Israel was established. And then comes the Memorial Day for the fallen soldiers, where we do it every year since we were established as a state. These are the two most sacred days for the Israelis, because we are a big army here. And we are, everyone sends, either goes to the army or later on sends his own children and grandchildren to the military. 
And we hold much greater value and much greater importance in not only sending our kids to the military, but also bringing them back, whether dead or alive, but bringing them back, back to Israel. And I'm going to, uh, exp- and this is why, by the way, I, I, I kind of, um, I think, shared a, a, a um, footage of how the Israelis stopped traffic and got off their car and stood still when the siren went off uh, for the memorial of, uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, and it's going to be the same thing this coming week. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be in Israel for that. I will be away. I will be in the U.S. and Canada. But in my heart, I will be here. Of course, now I have two children in the military. I myself am a major in the military. Um, and of course, um, I even lost my uncle in 1967 uh, right while he was in the military. So we are part of the family of the fallen soldiers and and um, we respect that day a lot. I'll, I'll give you a, and, and by the way, so this is why the Islamic Jihad and the, and the Hamas are initiating this violent circle because they know the Memorial Day and then the Day of Independence and then Israel is going to host the largest um, um, event of, uh, of, of music contest in the world, the Eurovision contest, uh, in about 10 days from now. So they're trying basically to embarrass us. Um, but I want to tell you something. We are not going to let them do that. And I want to tell you how important is a soldier to uh, the Israeli military. Um, over 27 years ago, um, Israel lost uh, three soldiers in a battle in Lebanon. Um, their bodies were taken later on by the Syrian military who then controlled part of Lebanon into um, into Syria to be buried somewhere. Now, at least one of them, the Israeli intelligence managed to know where he is buried. And uh, several attempts to get to that Palestinian um, refugee camp near Damascus to that cemetery and to get to that place, several attempts failed. And um, just about last year, towards the end of last year, um, the Israeli intelligence foiled um, a major, major terror attack on Russia. I know I may not be able to say that right now, but um, uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what and when and who, what. All I can tell you is this major, probably the 9-11 of Russia, was about to take place because right now everybody hates Russia. Russia, uh, you know, pretends to fight ISIS, so the Sunnis hate her. Uh, Russia pretends to stop the Shiites. R- Russia pretends to not care much about Assad, and so all the fra- the factions in Syria uh, love to hate the Russians. And there was supposed to be something major in Russia. Now Israel managed to intercept that and to foil it, and to uh, you know the Russian president was so thankful that. When he had Benjamin Netanyahu over um, in Moscow in one of the latest visits, he basically asked him, how can we help you? How can we, what can we do for you uh, in return to what you guys did for us? Um, And the Prime Minister of Israel said, "Uh, look, um, I know it might sound irreasonable to you, but we know where the bones of one of our fallen soldiers are um, buried. And uh, since you guys are now the uh, sovereigns in, in, in the greater part of Damascus, if your army could go and retrieve, we will tell you exactly the coordinate, exactly where it is. If you guys can go and retrieve the bones of that soldier um, for us, that would be great. And President Putin was looking at now. He says, "Didn't so you said it happened 27 years ago? He said, yes. So I said, what do you have to do with that? Why do you care about it? It's 27 years old case. And Netanyahu said to him, um, this is our nation. We care about our fallen soldiers, even if it's 20, 30, 40 years later. Our families wants to mourn over their dead ones, uh, over a tomb where the remains of the dead ones are. President Putin was so impressed and touched that he said to Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know what, ben, uh, Netanyahu, this one is on me. In other words, you can still ask whatever you want in return to what you did for us. But this one, it's not part of the, this is on me. I'll I'll take care of that. It's not one of the things I'm willing to give you. It's actually something I would love to give you for free. 
And uh, from that moment, he actually instructed his soldiers to start looking for that grave and, and retrieve the, the bones. And they did retrieve the bones of Zachariah Baumel and, and a couple other soldiers. And eventually, of course, a month ago, they brought it to be buried here in Israel in a big ceremony. And by the way, Israel was not forced to give something back because it was actually something that the Russians paid us back for what we did for them. Later on, the Israelis uh, thought that it'll be nice because the Syrian military did not stop the Russian thing uh, to maybe free a couple of Syrian, um, uh, Syrian you know, uh, captives that we have in our prison and we release them. And that's the story. And so what my point is this, that tells you how much important the remains of a fallen soldier are for the people of Israel, for the prime minister of Israel that has to deal with that. And how much I admire President Trump also for taking care of the remains of so many fallen soldiers from um, the Vietnam War, Korea War, and other places and bringing them back home even when it's 20, 30, 40 years later. I also want you to know that um, the... Um, the situation in Gaza might not um, uh, escalate more than that. Although they said we're going to hit Tel Aviv, we're going to hit Ben Gurion Airport, we're going to hit uh, the Dimona nuclear reactor. Of course, <laughs> look, we we know who we're dealing with. They always talk and talk and talk. They love this big talk, the macho and all of that. But we know exactly who they are and what they're capable of. And I think we made it very clear through the Egyptian mediators that um, they have a lot to lose and uh, it seems like there are some reports in Gaza right now there is some uh, we are great advanced in the uh, talks for a ceasefire right now and whenever those type of talks begin eventually it, it is only a matter of maybe hours before a ceasefire once again will start look um, but at least during those times Although we have two wounded people, we did destroy several very important targets that we had to destroy and we needed an excuse to strike and now they gave it to us. I want to tell you folks, before I continue and talk about uh, the Iranian in, uh, in Syria and of course um, other things that are happening over there, I wanted to tell you folks that uh, my filmed testimony made by Anchored North is now, um, it's a five minutes video of my testimony. You can find it on our YouTube, uh, excuse me, on our uh, Facebook and our um, also on our website. It's one of, uh, it's a very powerful short uh, testimony and I would appreciate if you just shared it with as many. We are really praying that as many uh, Jewish people as possible will see how a Jew found Christ as a Jewish Messiah and uh, they will be led to him uh, also. By the way, next week, as you know, I'm going to have a, a Congressional Caucus breakfast. I'm going to have 20 to 30 conservative congressmen that will come to a special breakfast where I'm going to speak. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm going to um, need your prayers for all of those things. Now, I also want to tell you that a few days ago... Um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, came uh, um, uh, you know, live on, on, on a video, 18 minutes long video. The first one in almost five years. The last time he was seen on a video was from a mosque in Iraq. You know, that was June of 2014. Ever since then, he has not been seen in public. And this was a recent video because he mentioned there... A uh, couple things. One of them is the terror attack in um, in Sri Lanka, and uh, he, I, you know what he said. He said that Muslims um, basically um, the, the terrorists brought joy to the hearts of the Muslim believers when they shook the houses and the churches of the Crusaders on their festival of Easter as a revenge. For El Baruj. Now, again, if you are not well versed with names and dates, and then let me tell you, El Baruj is the last stronghold that ISIS had in Syria 
And that was the one surprise President Trump prepared for ISIS. And that was the city right now is completely leveled to the ground. And ISIS was completely destroyed and lost every square inch it ever had as an independent caliphate. From that moment on, ISIS regrouped. I wish I could say ISIS is gone, but ISIS is not gone, just like Al-Qaeda is not gone. The difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS was always that ISIS believed in a sequence of territorial gains and already establishing now a caliphate, where Al-Qaeda thought, let's go one country at a time and later on bring them to submission and then create the caliphate. And that was the big difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And uh, it seems like ISIS is now becoming more of a new and more, I guess, destructive Al-Qaeda or the new version of Al-Qaeda, where now all the ISIS terror is going back to their uh, the countries and are having active terror cells in many different countries. And al-Baghdadi said... Um, they, they divide the world into uh, in provinces, and every province will have its own leader, and every province will have its own cells. And El Baghdadi said that we're ready to attack the French province, but then he mentioned also the Turkish province. And I, I believe that President Erdogan has a lot to worry about because uh, uh, not only the French are going to feel the hands of ISIS according to El Baghdadi's threat, but also the Turks themselves. Um, if you're asking me how is he even m communicating with his people and how do they even communicate with one another, of course their YouTube channel was blocked, their Facebook uh, was blocked, their Instagram is blocked and um, well they're using Telegram right now. Telegram is the new encrypted um, messaging uh, um, uh, platform and they're using Telegram and um, basically they are declaring a religious war. Now, let me explain something to you because a lot of people may not know that, but uh, the Western world is not willing to admit that there is a religious war here. Um, in Europe, they, they don't talk about it. The former administration in the U.S. is not talking about it. The, the words uh, Islamic terrorism are forbidden, even in parts of Australia and New Zealand. Let me tell you... I, I was a guest of a very, very senior commander in the Melbourne police. And he told me that they are not allowed to say Islamic terrorism in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I don't need to tell you the reaction of the Prime Minister of New Zealand after the Christchurch massacre over there and how suddenly Islam is the world you know, religion of peace and how the calling for prayer on, on the following Friday has to be live on radio and TV. And yet, uh, when it comes to the attack in Sri Lanka, uh, people refrain from even saying the word Christian. They only said Easter worshippers. It's very interesting because um, we have two different planets almost, two different realities almost. ISIS is uh, going for a, a religious war. And the Western world is saying there is no religious war. So we're, we're, we're talking about uh, those two things. And um, somebody needs to wake up the Western world, especially Europe, and tell them that religious war is there and they are going to get hit so, so badly. In fact, ISIS wants to fight two different things. He wants to fight the West, uh, the Christianity, and of course, he doesn't call them Christians. He calls them um, he calls them uh, crusaders. Why? Because if you study history, the crusaders massacred Muslims by the thousands on their way to the Holy Land and back. And therefore, for if you want to somehow raise up the anti-Christian feelings in the Muslims' hearts, you just call the Christians the crusaders, and that's all. But at the same time, ISIS is also fighting the Shiites, and, and this is the, the funny thing, you know, President Obama used to say that we are helping Iran because ISIS is Iran's, um, also Iran's um, um, enemy, and therefore we have a common enemy. Uh, folks, uh, this is uh, baloney because all, all that Iran wants is to create a sequence, uh, to create a bridge from Tehran all the way to the Mediterranean, 
And in the name of fighting ISIS, they've been advancing and bringing more militias and more people. And I will tell you something, folks. Uh, the month of April was the bloodiest month for Iranians and their militias and for Assad regime and even for some of the... Um, some of the um, Russian forces in the desert of Deir Azur, where uh, ISIS regrouped. And ISIS, uh, a lot of people say that it's like a, a phoenix. It rises up uh, from the sand and attacks and then goes and fades away. And it's very interesting because um, right now ISIS is just eliminating, completely taking away uh, I will say dozens, but it's almost close to over a hundred people every week um, that are traveling in caravans on the way from the western part of Syria to the eastern part of Syria. Caravans, complete caravans of five, six, seven vehicles disappear completely. And then you find the, the either Syrian or Iranian militias soldiers uh, with their hands cuffed behind their back and they're shot in their head. And ISIS continues to massacre them all the time. Now, it was also a very bad month for Iran. And this, uh, the month of May is even going to be worse for Iran. If uh, the sanction of President Trump on the Iranian oil industry lowered their uh, um, production from the time of Obama, two and a half million barrels a day, to right now about 1.1, which is more than 50%. The new sanctions we're estimating are going to lower it to almost just half a million barrels a day. This is devastating. I mean, that's why Iran cut all the, um, the um, credit uh, line to Syria. Iran used to give um, uh, Assad's forces uh, free oil, not free, but oil, and Assad was supposed to pay them later uh, by buying stuff from them. Well, Assad is broke. He has no money. Now he has no credit. That's why there's some long lines for gasoline in the uh, gas uh, stations all across Syria right now. And the Iranians are telling Assad, look, you personally have billions of dollars you stashed all over the world in your own bank accounts. If you want your people to have some oil, you need to pay. And we don't mind if you pay from your own money. So you can clearly see that Assad is with his back to the wall, that the Iranians are now running on empty, um, empty um, tank right now. And the situation is really escalating, even with the Turkish um, lira that is falling and collapsing. And on the other side, look at the American economy. Look at the job, re uh, the unemployment report. Uh, ever since 1969, there was no such low unemployment rate of 3.6, I think. Um, look at the stock market that is rallying like crazy. Look, even the biggest critics of President uh, Trump are, find no words. Now there's no Russian collusion. It's already proved. Now his, his actions actually work. And so when Trump is gaining support, recognition, and uh, momentum in his own country, and when the axis of evil is bleeding because of the dying uh, economies of those uh, countries that are relying only on, on uh, oil production, and with the escalation in Venezuela as well, uh, you can clearly see why the Russians uh, and the Chinese uh, are, are allowing Kim Jong-un to... Uh, just break loose a little bit and why also uh, they understand that uh, America is um, really um, I guess making them pretty jealous in a way I would say this folks um, we are watching quite an amazing things that are happening and um, El Baghdadi just so you know said two things in his speech by the way he said the Crusader nation acted in barbaric uh, way against us that it is unforgivable. And then he said the Muslims fought in such an amazing spirit and the battle of Islam um, and, and its people against the Crusaders is far from ending. So uh, the Ramadan is about to start and uh, 
we're going to watch uh, uh, normally of course is is the bloodiest month of the year um, and uh, I would say Europe uh, get ready Turkey get ready in the Western world they did not feel the hands of Isis in in the last uh, wave of terrorism simply because of great intelligence much thanks to the Israeli intelligence that is tipping um, those countries uh, um, over and over again and again um, but uh, I can tell you one thing um, it's not going to be forever and this is another reason why Europe is going to fall on its knees begging for a deliverer to come and, 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 and deliver them from their agonies and all of their uh, situation so now you understand how things work here now you understand what is going on on the Gaza Strip do I see solution for the Palestinians? I do not. I, I, I just think that the minute they will understand that Israel is nothing, they can fight and destroy and eliminate. Uh, the minute they lay down their weapons, uh, there will be peace. Uh, somebody said if uh, the Palestinians will lay down their weapons, there will be no more war. When Israel will lay down its weapon, there will be no more Israel. That's how it works, folks. And uh, we have to... Uh, understand uh, on the other side there's very few that wants peace most of them wants our destruction they wants to live instead of us not next to us um, we already exposed that uh, deal we already know that once we move Jerusalem from the table and the return to, uh, of the of refugees fake refugees to back here we move that from the table and once we remove the two-state solution from the table they're clueless. They're, they're helpless. They don't know what else they can do. And um, it's very, very sad. Um, it, it, I noticed, by the way, that the new rhetorics of the progressive left in America, and it's also coming to the Israeli progressive uh, lunatic uh, uh, liberals, is that um, don't do to the Palestinians what uh, the Nazis did for you. And this is cheap. This is stupid also, because the Nazis are have uh, um, documented the biggest genocide in history of, uh, world, uh, of the world, and they documented it and, and admitted that. Um, Israel has, is doing nothing but trying to help the Palestinians. It's them themselves who destroy themselves. The Hamas is getting money, but he's not giving it to its people. Therefore, its people are demonstrating against them, not against us. Whoever shoots the rockets are not the people of Gaza, but it's the Hamas. So, to... to I heard a progressive Israeli journalist that says that the Gaza is the Gaza ghetto. Uh, and um, if you only know history and you know what happened, you would, you would understand how stupid it is to even make that comparison and how, how much the progressive, lunatic, left liberals are, they don't mind crossing any borders in order to establish a case against Israel. But it's not going to work. And the only, the only deception that is going to work, unfortunately I'm saying that, is uh, that after the coming war, there will be a very fake peace for about seven years that it will be broken three and a half years later. That is going to work. By the way, I can promise you that it's going to work because the Bible says so. He will increase a covenant. He will, the Antichrist will probably you know, offer a deal not only where Israel is going to stay in Jerusalem and have independence, but also build a temple, of course. So it's going to be very, very, very interesting um, um, how it's going to happen. But one thing is for sure, even that deception is not going to work for the long run because as I always preach and I always teach, the tribulation is for Israel's salvation. So that which the enemy, enemy meant for evil, God will use for a good purpose eventually. And as Hosea 5.15 says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense and in their affliction they will earnestly seek me. Israel will earnestly seek the Lord through a terrible affliction that will come upon the house of uh, upon Jacob, as, as Jeremiah 30 says. But they will be delivered from it. Jeremiah, at the same verse that is promising that Jacob's trouble, the, the, the tribulation, 
He says, but they will be delivered from it. Why? Because they're going to turn to the Lord. Just like Zechariah says, and they're going to uh, repent. They will see the one whom they pierce when Christ will return over here with us. And they will repent. And that will be the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. And their repentance will be the fulfillment of the Feast of, Taberna of um, uh, Yom Kippur uh, atonement. And then the Millennial Kingdom will be, of course, the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. So those last three festivals, of course, will happen on the day and in the same sequence of the first um, four that took place 2,000 years ago. And so we have four festivals fulfilled 2,000 years ago in the 69th week. And we're going to have the last three fulfilled in the same sequence in the, at the end of the 70th week. And we are right now, and I'm talking about Daniel, of course, 9. We're right now in that valley between the 69th and the 70th week of the total 70 weeks that the Lord revealed to Daniel that will be determined from the moment King Artaxerxes will allow Nehemiah to build the walls of Jerusalem um, all the way to the very end uh, of, of God's dealing with Israel. So it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm looking forward to our upcoming conference um, right after the Congressional Caucus breakfast, I will be heading towards Toronto, where I'm going to be speaking about the day approaching. A, a very, very challenging uh, message, um, thought-provoking on, on what day is approaching. And, and of course, that's, these are the verses from Hebrews chapter 10. What hope is it that we're uh, 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 going to talk about? Who is the one who gives you the hope? And... Um, what promise is it and who is the promiser? It's going to be, I can't wait. And after that, I will be speaking, of course, in Tennessee at Grace Chapel. And from there, I will go all the way to Parker, Colorado, next to Denver for another conference. Uh, so I'm looking forward. There's be quite a few new messages that I'm going to give. And I'm really looking forward to all of that. I will need your prayers for the DC meetings and for the conferences and in other places. Um, the Romania conference was a uh, Romania speaking tour was amazing. Thank you for praying for me right after my last update. The last push of of of, of Saturday night, uh, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Monday morning and Monday evening was in Timisoara and Arad was unbelievable. Thousands of thousands of people showed up. The pastors were all so open for the word and so open for even some exhortation. And they want me back there. And of course, I don't know if I can do that right away. But um, our ministry is going to purchase from the Romanian distributor my books in Romanian. And we're going to send hundreds of them uh, to the Romanian churches I visited. So the people can have good education of the end times and the very great promise that we all have. So again... I'm thanking the Lord for that which he did last week and for that that he's about to do next week and for the great week I had here at home with my family. Thank you for your prayers. My daughter is in military. My son is also um, and we had great time here this weekend um, and I'm heading tomorrow evening all the way to that journey that I will need um, a lot, a lot of prayers from you. Good. So I think I covered everything. By the way, the Awaiting His Return conferences in Perth and Melbourne, as well in Australia, as well as um, Auckland, New Zealand, all of them are open for registration. In, in, in Melbourne, over 1,000 people already registered. Uh, Perth is a little slow, and but we, we know how it is. It, it picks up uh, as we get closer. Auckland is, is new and it's open. Go ahead and register. Uh, me and Pastor Barry Stagner will make it to Australia and New Zealand, and we can't wait to share with you messages of, of hope and uh, educate you all on uh, what is going on, the schemes of the enemy, and the hope that we have in Christ for his church uh, right before he returns. Thank you for everything. I will end up all of this with the ironic blessing. יאר אדוני פנה ולך ויחונך יסא אדוני פנה ולך ויאסם לך שלום the lord bless you and keep you the lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you 
The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. May you have a peaceful, peaceful week ahead of you. I would like to share with you one last verse. And uh, I want you to remember that. It's in Revelation 5. One of the saddest moments um, when John is in, in heaven. Uh, John, the Bible says uh, um, in verse uh, 6. And, and I looked and I behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. And though it had, it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him. Now, all of that happened, by the way, in verse 4, John saw the scrolls and he said, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was um, able to open the scroll or even to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy. And then, of course, Jesus, when, I, when he, Jesus, the slain lamb, taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before, now who knows, maybe 12 disciples and 12 tribes of Israel, but then they... And golden bowls full of incense, which the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And then he says, and we, listen to this, we shall reign on the earth he's speaking to the church which is in heaven about the fact that we shall reign on the earth when we come back with him we shall reign on the earth we have a wonderful wonderful promise if you are a believer if you are a redeemed person that yes he's going to redeem your body but then when everyone is un un incapable when not even a single creature on top, on earth or below, is able to even think or able to even open that scroll and the seals, there is only one that is worthy and is able. And when he does it, he does it with all the seals that are actually very great judgments on the non-believers. And of course, with the promise that we are about we shall reign on earth with him wow 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 so so of course the the saints of the tribulation will be resurrected at the end and they will reign with us but we are there to behold and to watch and when people are telling you that he's not coming back and all the scoffers and all the the all the doubters all the naysayers hey i understand why they are acting like that. Even in heaven. There was a great silence. And John. Before he saw Jesus. And understood. And, and everybody started singing. John wept. John wept because. He understood. There is no one over there. That can do that. And then he realized. <laughs> there is one. And that one is a slain Lamb of God. That means Jesus that had already been slain. That, that's the, this is the Lion of the tribe of Judah now. No longer is a slain Lamb of God that is going to open. He overcame. It's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He endured. And He, by the power of His resurrection, by he, the power of His endless life, He is going to also be opening the seals and he's also going to allow us not only to be redeemed by his blood but to come back and rule on earth with him what a great promise to end up this update with so thank you i love you god bless you
from Galilee, Israel. Thank God if things are calming down right now. No takeoffs. <laughs> it looks like um, it's going to be a, a, a quieter week, but if not, you know, God is in control. Thank you. God bless you. Keep in your prayers. This coming Wednesday, I will be in Washington, D.C. speaking, and then in Toronto for Friday, Saturday, and then more things next week. I love you. Thank you. God bless you. And as always, I, I thank you for your prayers and support in this ministry, uh, without which uh, we couldn't do much. Uh, we, we cherish that. As By the way, uh, speaking of prayers, because I believe prayers are the most important engine, the Bible says in that same chapter, chapter 5, when he spoke on that, he says, he says, look at this. He says um, uh, that right in front of him in verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, and each having a harp, a golden bowl full of what? Incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints are the incense before the Lord. And they are in a great place right there in the heavenlies, right before the Lord himself. So I want to encourage you to continue to pray and to, to do what you need to do. Um, both, of course, for Behold Israel, but also for, you know, there's so many people around you that need your prayer. And so many people around you that count on your prayer. So look around you. Stop, uh, you know, let's, let's talk less and pray more. Let's uh, type less and pray more. Let's attack less and pray more. Let's... Uh, um, gossip less and pray more thank you again god bless you and shalom from galilee bye bye and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever